On today's episode, the Starliner Saga gets even stranger, the Chinese land a reusable rocket booster, and the Europeans complete testing of their new heavy launcher. The ongoing saga of the Boeing Starliner capsule continues to get even stranger as we head into another week of departure delays. After an arrival at the ISS that was fraught with technical malfunctions, the Starliner crew of astronauts Butch Williams and Sonny Wilmore were scheduled for a short, one-week layover on the station before making their return to Earth. Of course, their trip to orbit was then extended to two weeks, then three weeks. Now it's looking like at least one month, with a new tentative return set for early July. We know that Starliner will have to remain docked until at least July 2nd, as that's when NASA wants to conduct a spacewalk that had originally been scheduled for the 13th, which was the first reason that had been given to delay Starliner's departure. And then the spacewalk itself was also delayed. Now we're hearing from NASA that they still want to conduct the extravehicular activity prior to Starliner undocking. We've also been told that more data collection from the Starliner service module is important for chasing down the root cause of the multiple technical malfunctions that have occurred so far on this trip. NASA Commercial Crew Program Manager Steve Stitch told reporters, quote, We are letting the data drive our decision making relative to managing the small helium system leaks and thruster performance we observed during rendezvous and docking. He added that NASA now planned to carry out an agency-level review of Starliner before its departure given the duration of the mission. As for Boeing, the company's vice president Mark Nappi said, quote, This is an opportunity to fully understand the system's performance without the pressure of schedule or time. We have the time. We'll let the data drive our decision making. And the general idea put forth here by Boeing is that they want to conduct as much testing on the service module as they possibly can before it gets jettisoned into space and burns up in the atmosphere. Starliner has 28 reaction control thrusters. The five that are known to be problematic right now are located in the rear-facing segment of the service module. There are a total of eight thrusters that can push the Starliner forward. One was taken offline in the process of docking, as its thrust reading fell to zero. The remaining seven thrusters were hot-fired in a testing procedure on June 15th. Each thruster was fired for 1.2 seconds, and performance was measured by the ISS navigation system. They were judging by how much the thruster was able to push the 1 million pound space station. That test resulted in nominal readings for all seven thrusters, and the initial conclusion was that the thruster system is prone to overheating in high-use situations, such as docking. The higher temperature may have caused the hypergolic propellant to vaporize, which would then interrupt the mixture of the self-combusting oxidizer and fuel, and result in lower thrust readings than expected. So, it's not like all the delays and testing have been in vain. Boeing does seem to be learning a lot about their spacecraft. Though it's probably worth noting that Starliner launched for the first time in 2019, and then again in 2022, so they did have five years to figure this stuff out before sending people to space inside the capsule. And I've also noticed that SpaceX can have their entire rocket just explode in midair and still gather enough data to fix the issues on subsequent flights, but that's all we're going to say about that. Following the July 2nd spacewalk, it looks like conditions will be right for a Starliner landing as early as July 4th, which is very patriotic. Since the Starliner is designed to land on solid ground and not in the ocean, the vehicle needs to hit a very specific window to target the ideal landing site at the White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico. That window opens up once every four days. Starliner has been said to have a 45-day limit of time that it can remain at the ISS. Though we're not exactly sure what is dictating that particular timeline or how strict the limitation might be, and for what it's worth, NASA emphasized in their latest statement that Starliner could return if an emergency situation were to require that. Steve Stitch said, quote, So far, we don't see any scenario where Starliner is not going to be able to bring Butch and Sonny home. We're just taking a little extra time to resolve the data and also learn as much as we can while we have the service module in orbit. 
state-owned Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology has completed a successful vertical takeoff and landing test of a new rocket booster design. The test vehicle was powered by three methane-burning rocket engines and lifted off from the Gobi Desert on June 23rd. The booster is reported to have reached an altitude of 12 kilometers before returning for a successful touchdown at a nearby landing site, and we actually have some decent video of this flight. Of course, some key moments have been redacted because China, but still, everything looked to be very smooth. Uh, reports say that the booster did not use any movable fins for steering, and at least one of the engines remained on for the duration of the flight. So this is very similar to early testing that SpaceX was doing back in 2012 with their Grasshopper prototype, and also in the early stages of Starship development with the Starhopper in 2019. So the Chinese are definitely on the right track here. Their next test hop is going to be targeting 70 kilometers in altitude and will use dynamic grid fins for steering control. And then an orbital test flight is planned for 2025. And this rocket is expected to carry as much as six and a half tons to an orbit that is as high as Sun Synchronous at around 700 kilometers. Although the Chinese might still see their first orbital landing this year as the commercial rocket company named Deep Blue is hoping to launch and land their Nebula 1, which is a two-stage, 3.35 meter diameter rocket that uses nine variable thrust, 3D printed engines capable of deploying two tons to low Earth orbit. Reusable first stage boosters are definitely a technology that would serve the Chinese well. Just last week, we saw a video of a Long March 2 first stage plummeting back to Earth fully intact and then crash landing over top of a populated area. Having a rocket fall from space and land on your town is not good under any circumstance, but this manages to be made even worse by the fact that Long March 2 is a hypergolic rocket booster, meaning that all of that colorful gas you see pouring out of the wreckage as it hurtles towards the ground is an incredibly toxic mixture of nitrogen tetroxide and hydrazine. This is very bad stuff, and if you want an example, look up the Nedelin catastrophe at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. It happened in 1960. Up to 300 Soviets were killed by a hypergolic engine malfunction, and many more than that were poisoned. Most of the old Chinese launch sites were constructed deep inland to try and conceal them from the Americans back in the Cold War days, but as the country's population exploded over the coming decades, they've ended up with a lot of people living underneath rocket flight paths who regularly get bits of space debris landing on or near them. Anyway, I don't want to end up on China's blacklist either, so moving on. The European Space Agency's new heavy lift rocket has cleared its final testing milestone and is ready to take flight in July. The Ariane 6 completed a wet dress rehearsal at the ESA launch site in French Guyana on June 21st. That's when they fully fuel and prep the rocket for launch, then run the countdown timer until just a few seconds before ignition. They don't actually light the engines, but they just confirm that all systems leading up to the ignition are working as intended and according to ESA, everything went as planned. This new rocket is very critical for European space activity. Their previous Ariane 5 made its final flight nearly one year ago, while their smaller launch vehicle, the Vega C, has been offline since a failure over a year and a half ago, and that's combined with Europe losing access to the Baikonur Cosmodrome and the Soyuz rocket due to that whole Russia-Ukraine invasion situation. The Ariane Group is based in France and the vehicle is developed under a contract from ESA. With up to four solid rocket boosters attached, the Ariane 6 is pretty comparable to the new Vulcan Centaur rocket from ULA, just under 22 tons of max capacity to low Earth orbit and up to five tons delivered to geostationary orbit. These will lift off exclusively exclusively from the Guyana Space Center, which is located in a French colony in South America, conveniently providing an equatorial launch site that wouldn't be possible from continental Europe. Although it does make transporting payloads down there a giant pain in the ass. Uh, if you just look up the voyage of the James Webb Space Telescope, it was pretty harrowing. ESA is currently targeting July 9th for the first orbital launch of their new rocket. It will be carrying eight CubeSats that will be deployed into low Earth orbit and five payloads that will remain attached to the rocket's upper stage. It will also deploy two re-entry capsules, 
one developed by Ariane Group and the other by The Exploration Company, a European startup that recently won an ESA award to establish a commercial cargo space program. 